This is interview number six with the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Jeremy Hayward. And the difference with uh, this interview and the earlier ones is that Sir Jeremy is the current Cabinet Secretary, so it's very exciting to be here on this uh, very wet, miserable March afternoon in 2013, interviewing Sir Jeremy here in the Pillard Room in Downing Street. And the first question, Sir Jeremy, is how would you describe the role of Cabinet Secretary? The role of Cabinet Secretary, I think, is to be, uh, at one and the same time, um, the Prime Minister's chief policy advisor mm -hmm. from a civil service perspective. Um, in these days of coalition, the Deputy Prime Minister's uh, chief policy advisor as well. Yeah. Uh, but also, at the same time as that, to be the sort of advisor to the Cabinet and the custodian of the Cabinet system. So I help the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister think through what should be on the Cabinet agenda. I sit next to the Prime Minister in Cabinet and take a record of what's been discussed and what's being agreed. And every now and again, the Prime Minister bashes his finger and says, that should be in the minutes, Cabinet Secretary. So we take particular notice at that point. Um, and making sure that then that, that is followed through. But I think the core of the job is really to be the sort of policy advisor to the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, and the custodian of the way the Cabinet operates. And is this written down in a rule book uh, that says this is the job of the Cabinet Secretary in the United Kingdom, or is it just by word of mouth? If it is written down somewhere, I wish someone had shown me the book. Um, I, I suspect lots of books have been written about it, and uh, press releases were written at the time when we uh, made the change from Gus to myself and Bob Kerslake, because obviously at that time we were splitting up uh, an integrated job, Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Home Civil Service. Um, so we thought quite a bit about the job description at that point. But I'm not aware that there's a manual anywhere that tells you what the Cabinet Secretary's job is. I wish there was. This is a, a vast job. How, in fact, day by day, do you decide what you're going to give your attention to? Are you reacting to the flow of work or are you able to define what you're going to give priority to? You can, to some extent, shape your own agenda. Um, obviously, if you're going to be advising the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, you have to some extent be uh, responsive to their requirements and their diaries. So sometimes I will have a, a set of meetings in my diary for the day. I'm looking forward to some long-term thinking, and that gets completely sidetracked by you know, a sudden requirement to be involved in a, an, an issue of the moment. But there's quite a good balance in the job between responding to the day-to-day, -day, which I don't do that much of, but sometimes the issue is, is so critical that the Prime Minister or Deputy Prime Minister you know, wants to have me you know, in the room uh, for those sorts of crises. Um, it's a mixture between the day-to-day, -day, the sort of, uh, say, policy implementation side where uh, a senior minister or the cabinet has asked the cabinet secretary to get involved in helping drive delivery, uh, through to quite long-term thinking. I mean, I've just started a sort of horizon scanning group, for example, to fill a little gap which I thought was in the, in the cabinet office before, and we'll be thinking great thoughts about you know, what the world will be like in 15, 20 years' time. Uh, and that's, you know, that hopefully those will be quite long meetings which don't get interrupted by the day-to-day. -day. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a diversity. It's one of the things I like about the job. And uh, is there a typical day? What, what kind of uh, work day does the Cabinet Secretary have? Uh, there isn't really a typical day. Uh, there are some patterns. So Tuesdays we have Cabinet in the morning and that takes an hour and a half of the day. And then in the evening I have to sort of finish the minutes off. Uh, Wednesdays we have the Permanent Secretary's meeting uh, as a group uh, at 10 o'clock uh, while the Prime Minister is preparing Prime Minister's question time. We meet um, uh, every morning we kick off in the Prime Minister's office with a, a morning meeting. Uh, he often has an afternoon meeting as well. I have a regular session with the Deputy Prime Minister, obviously one-on-one. -on -one. So there are sort of fixed points in the day. Mm. Um, I generally start about 6.30 with my first sort of dip into my Blackberry. I've got two Blackberries actually, so mm -hmm. I have a few blackberries to clear off overnight, uh, reading the press summaries. Mm. I come into work at about 7.30, get here about 8. Um, and by that point, you really need to be on top of what's happening in the, in the sort of media. Uh, and as I say, the Prime Minister has a morning meeting, which quite often sets the agenda for the, for the sort of working day. But I do try to avoid just getting sucked into 
you know, what's happening in number 10, you know, minute by minute. That, that's a, a previous job I used to do in number 10. And the cabinet secretary is supposed to sort of stay in formation a little bit and mm -hmm. stick to my diary and, and actually make sure that the, the urgent doesn't crowd out the important. Does the BlackBerry enhance the work of the cabinet secretary? And, and how did these people cope before Blackberries? Or was life easier? I think life was easier in some ways. Uh, definitely the pace of government has in, in, increased, and I think BlackBerry contributes to that, and facilitates it in some ways. Uh, I have this argument with my wife the whole time as to whether holidays are better uh, with Blackberries or not. In, in the olden days, you, you know, you could go... Sort of not, not so old, actually. Maybe yeah. sort of 10 years ago, you could go a whole day without really thinking about work, but you'd have a looming sense of all the things that you didn't know about back in the office. And so that would sort of ruin the evening, and you'd have several phone calls and probably spend your whole evening catching up. This is my theory. Mm. Uh, whereas if you've got BlackBerry, you can just do little bits of work during the day uh, and have your evenings free. My and wife doesn't necessarily agree with that. No. She, she thinks that that is um, just a bit of uh, excuse. If she had her way, she'd probably take both my blackberries and throw them in the sea. Yeah. And um, what advice did you get about blackberries and any other matter from Sir Gus O'Donnell, who we interviewed for the programme? I don't think Gus gave me a single piece of advice about blackberries, actually. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, Gus and I have been working together for many, many years. He brought me back into the civil service in 2007, uh, where I was languishing in the city. Um, and we spent a lot of time together. So... It was really a process of osmosis by which he imparted his considerable wisdom rather than a set-piece moment in which he, he told me how to do the job. Was it helpful, and if so, in what way, in doing the job of Cabinet Secretary, the fact that you had worked here in Number 10 and knew many of the people? That's incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really important to understand how Number 10 works and the pressures on the Prime Minister and to get to know, the, obviously, the people. Um, but uh, just knowing how the Prime Minister likes to operate, how he likes to be advised, um, just knowing the daily rhythm, but also fundamentally having been through quite a few crises, uh, knowing you know, what is a real crisis versus what looks like a short-term crisis, um, I think that just makes you more confident about doing the rest of the job. It gives you a, a sense of perspective about uh, how to handle the daily business. I think, frankly, if you hadn't had that experience and came in as cabinet secretary, you'd probably be run ragged because you'd probably want to get sucked into pretty much everything to start with just to sort of prove, your, your, prove yourself and make sure you understand what's going on. Having been through quite a lot of that in a more junior role, I don't feel the need to be just all the time dealing with the urgent. And I think that, that, that is the distinction, really, between the cabinet secretary role and the roles I've previously played. How does one tell the difference between a real crisis and a peripheral crisis? It depends, but it <laughs> survives more than one news cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, have a, you can sniff that out. You have the nostrils for it, do you? Well, I mean, I wouldn't claim any superior knowledge on this, but you, know, you basically get a sense over time as to whether an issue is sort of developing into an even bigger problem yeah. or can be managed down. Um, but it's, not, it, it, it's a team effort. The great thing about Number 10 is it's, it's, it's a team. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got great press people, you've got great special advisors, the private office is always there. Um, on, on any particular issue, you quickly assemble the right group of people and you, almost by intuition, you, you need to write down you're on this team today. People just come together. Um, and my role is increasingly not to do the running around and the drafting of speeches, but just to sort of add a few bits of wise advice in. And you talk about knowing how Number 10 works. Does it, in fact, work pretty much the same regardless of the prime ministerial incumbent? I think in many ways it does. I mean, obviously, the way the garden rooms work and the duty clerks work and the custodians and the switchboard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of the staff know what their roles are, do them brilliantly day in, day out, regardless of who the prime minister is. But I think the private officers are working methods and timetables can work can change. Mm. The role of the policy unit, the nature of the policy unit, the way the press office is configured, uh, the relationship of all of the above to the Treasury, to the Cabinet Office, to other departments, all of those things do change uh, depending on the characters of the Prime Minister and the, na the nature of the government. Yeah. Do you, is it important for the Cabinet Secretary to have a public face? Not really, no. I mean, I think it's important that 
senior civil servants and civil service more generally know who the cabinet secretary is and know that that's a person uh, who will look after their interests and try and protect them and try to inspire them in some way. So I think there's a sort of, there's a facing the civil service role. Mm -hmm. And of course, as cabinet secretary, you do appear before select committees and, and so on. Um, and I know Gus made a few speeches in his career and a few uh, cabinet secretaries have done the same. But in general, it's a, it's a sort of job which faces the politicians and faces the cabinet. And, you know, you operate effectively uh, trying to sort of support them. You shouldn't be a big separate public figure in my, in my view. It's not, it's, not, it's not really what their role is there for. So looking back over cabinet secretaries since the war, there hasn't really been a significant change in their public profile. They've always been pretty much um, backroom faces. Yeah, I think as a general rule, that is the case. I think, you know, by the time he'd done sort of six years, I think Gus was quite a public figure, mm. had done quite a few interviews and, you know, ma magazine pieces and so on. But even Gus, who's probably the most media savvy and most media friendly uh, of, of recent cabinet secretaries, um, even he was pretty much a backroom guy, and that's definitely you know my philosophy as well. The cabinet itself, uh, the most important uh, body in British government, collective responsibility. Does that still apply? Do you think? Very much so. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, I and my office from time to time get. Uh, requests. So you occasionally have, you know, uh, some exceptions, but generally speaking, we do insist, and people are happy to comply with the rules uh, that all cabinet ministers must have an opportunity of commenting on and, you know, approving uh, an announcement or a change of policy before it's made. Sometimes that goes to a cabinet committee meeting, full cabinet. More often, it's a, a written right round. Uh, but I think everybody thinks it's valuable that they have an opportunity to sort of put their departmental or political view uh, before something becomes the government's policy. Uh, and that's a really important principle of cabinet government. And, and at what point does it become the policy of cabinet when the prime minister sums up at the end of the meeting? Yes. Yeah. As I say, there's not that many issues that go to cabinet for formal approval as opposed to a cabinet committee yep. or a written right round. But until, that, until the chairman, chairperson of the cabinet committee has either written to say it's now agreed or summed up a meeting to say that's now been agreed, it isn't the collectively agreed policy. And it's all the more important, I think, in a coalition uh, that both sides of the coalition feel they've got the opportunity of expressing their point of view. I mean, a lot of the issues we deal with were set down in the coalition agreement in black and white in very clear language. Uh, so it's pretty clear what the coalition policy is. But in other areas, in some areas, the coalition parties come to an issue from different perspectives. And if both of them are going to go out and defend it, they've both got to have the opportunity of sort of helping to shape it. And one of the most significant changes to cabinet in the post-war period has been the cutting down from two to one uh, regular meeting a week. Uh, how do you manage, you know, an hour and a half to, to capture the essence of everything that's going on? Well, we don't try and capture the essence of everything that's going on. We, we do have, uh, always have a discussion about parliamentary business. Mm -hmm. So whatever's important that's going on in Parliament, that is discussed. We have a f two or three domestic policy items, and we usually have a couple of foreign policy items. But we don't try and cover the whole waterfront in every meeting. There are other Cabinet committees, and lots of things don't need to come to Cabinet. Yeah. So is Cabinet more for discussion uh, and less for decision? Yes, I think the full cabinet uh, is more for discussion, more for advanced warning of issues, uh, for early steerage of issues, rather than taking formal papers and agreeing points A, B and C. Mm -hmm. uh, that's usually left to cabinet committees, subcommittees of cabinet, essentially. And your role during the meetings is uh, partly as a prompter to the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. uh, but also to write the minutes themselves. Yes. And and, and then you circulate them that evening. How does that process happen? Uh, well, it's, there's a lot of secrecy about this, and I'm not going to give away all the secrets. But uh, no, I mean, my, my role in cabinet is, yes, as you say, to prompt the prime minister to make sure that he, he sees who's trying to intervene, occasionally pass him notes, but not often. I mean, he, he reads his brief. Um, he's a very good chair of a meeting. Um, and I take the note. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with a team of sec secretaries at the end of the table, they, together with me and my team, put together the, the record in the evening. And we do try and get it out in the evening or you know, within 24 hours anyway. Yes. 
And the, the, the job of uh, Cabinet Secretary in a coalition government, did you uh, go back at all and, and study what uh, Edward Bridges did as Cabinet Secretary in the Second World War? Is it particularly difficult? I didn't go back and study the history books. Maybe I should. Uh, you, you need to give me some references, Anthony. Well, uh, 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 will do. Yeah, to you, follow. You, you say. Um, I mean, obviously, I didn't become cabinet secretary until the coalition yeah. had been operating for quite a few uh, months, in fact, whatever a year. Yeah. So I'd already seen it in action from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, it, that that aspect of it didn't particularly surprise me, or didn't yeah. call for any particular preparation. Uh, as I say, I think it's all the more important in a coalition to have a well-functioning cabinet, yeah. a cabinet committee and collective responsibility system. And we, I, I feel as though we do have that. Uh, and the decisions on what items are taken in full cabinet and what are taken in cabinet committee, is that one shared between the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister? Well, we have a team of people, including representatives from the Deputy Prime Minister's office and, uh, and, the, and the Prime Minister's office, um, and we meet to discuss the forthcoming agendas, and there's a debate about that, and then we put it formally to the Prime Minister and also give the Deputy Prime Minister a chance to comment, mm. um, and it's usually not a matter of contention. The uh, people who you've met in your uh, time, and this question goes back to <coughs> your time working in the building, mm. um, Perhaps it would be interesting just to have on record uh, the, how you first came into Number 10, uh, into the Prime Minister's private office, and uh, follow that story through, mm. and your return. Well, I first came into Downing Street in 1997, um, in the autumn of 1997, uh, when I got a phone call from Jonathan Powell saying, completely out of a blue sky as far as I was concerned, saying the Prime Minister would like to meet me with a view to inter interview me for a job as his sort of Treasury or Domestic Affairs, I think, Private Secretary, uh, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, so I rocked up there, I think, the next day, mm. and Tony Blair was sitting on his, on his sofa, mm. um, one of his sofas, uh, eating an apple, eating his lunch, uh, and I had what was probably the sort of easiest interview of modern times. I mean, it was just, I, I concluded from that he'd either decided before I went in that I'd got the job or, you know, or the opposite. Mm. Uh, but he certainly didn't find anything out about me or my ability to do the job from the interview that we had. It was a perfectly amicable half hour. It felt like, you know, just whiling away the time while he was having his lunch. I heard nothing then for weeks. And then suddenly I got summoned to meet Derry Irvin. Mm. Uh, in his chambers. Um, by contrast, I then had an absolutely grueling hour and a half interview uh, from uh, the Lord Chancellor. Um, and uh, I must have passed that because I, then I got offered the job within a sort of a few hours after, the, after this. So I found myself in, in Downing Street in 97. And I stayed until the end of 2003, I think. Mm -hmm. Went off into banking for a bit. Uh, and then Gordon Brown persuaded me to come back with a combination of Gordon Brown and Gus, of course, mm. uh, and Ed Balls, actually, um, uh, persuaded me to come back and take a new job in, in the Cabinet Office as a um, d Domestic Affairs Permanent Secretary in charge of uh, sort of Domestic Affairs mm. Policy, um, at the point at which Gordon Brown became Prime Minister. Um, I did that for a bit, and then he decided that uh, he wanted me not in the cabinet office, but to come into uh, Downing Street. Um, and I was a bit reluctant to do that because I just I felt I'd already done my stint in Downing Street as sort of principal private secretary. And I, by then I was a sort of permanent secretary. Um, and I didn't really want to come back in to do my old job. Um, but we, we sort of banded job titles around and uh, we agreed a sort of you know, a structure for the job, uh, which I, in, in the end, concluded might work. Um, so I came back into Downing Street in t beginning of 2008. Um, and uh, we had an extraordinary period because it was, you know, the financial crisis and, you know, we had a huge task of recapitalizing the UK banking system. And, and then we had the uh, G20 summit in London, which was an extraordinary moment. Um, so it was a really intense period. Mm. Then we had the, the sort of run down to the general election 2010. Um, and I stayed on as permanent secretary to the prime minister um, really until the end of 2011 and then became cabinet secretary. So 
it was really 2008 to 2000, um, well, at the end of 2011, that I uh, was back in Downing Street. So different, different roles for three different prime ministers. And before even your um, conversation in the den with Tony Blair, mm -hmm. you'd been very familiar with this building because of your work as private secretary to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yes, but actually, as, uh, as principal private secretary to the Chancellor, I didn't really come here very often. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tradition now that whenever the Chancellor of the Exchequer meets the Prime Minister, the Chancellor's private secretary comes mm -hmm. and, and joins the meeting. But in those days, this, we're talking about sort of Black Wednesday and those sorts of times, the Prime Minister didn't really allow anybody from the Treasury in the room apart from the Chancellor. Mm -hmm. and so the Chancellor went on his own uh, into those meetings. Um, so I, I came here a few times, mm -hmm. but not very often. But you knew about the operation of the building? Yeah, but you never really know about an operation of a building until you actually come and work here. So, so what did you learn? What was the biggest surprise when you actually physically came into the building? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, what strikes you fairly early on is just the sort of extraordinary Rolls-Royce machine that mm -hmm. supports the private secretaries in, uh, in Downing Street. I mean, it's a lovely place to work from that perspective. You've got some wonderful staff in the garden rooms and the duty clerks. Everybody's incredibly friendly. It's, I mean, after you know, Treasury's quite a small place and quite, quite a sort of a lot of good corps d'esprit and, you know, quite friendly despite its image. Mm -hmm. But um, coming to a much smaller place like Downing Street, mm -hmm. sort of 150, 200 people, whatever it was then, uh, it's a small, friendly, non-hierarchical, fast-moving place, more like, a, more like a home almost. Um, but the thing, that in terms of the job content, that really struck you as being a private secretary in Downing Street is that you were the person who had to give all the advice, whereas being the private secretary to the Chancellor, you had a whole machine, the Treasury, providing the advice, and all you did was just provide a little bit of challenge and sort of you know, help along the way. But suddenly, you, you know, if you're working for the Prime Minister, you're the person who's got to write the three-page note on what's going on in the economy. Um, of course, you can attach the Treasury paper if you can extract one from the Treasury. Mm. Um, but uh, you're much more the sort of principal advisor, as it were, as opposed to the person just stapling together the papers and making sure that they go in the box. And is there a kind of unique uh, energy about this building that allows people to work these very long hours and to keep focused? Yeah, I think you know other parts of Whitehall too uh, have their moments, and you know places like the Treasury and the Foreign Office are under a lot of pressure, and the MOD mm -hmm. when we're fighting a war. But yeah, I think Number Ten is is uniquely sort of twenty four seven. Um, there's always somebody somewhere in Number Ten having a bit of a crisis. Uh, you know, you're unlucky if it's you the same. You know, if every crisis follows you around, um, and that's the tough thing about being the principal private secretary or whatever. It's obviously the Prime Minister who has to deal with everything. Um, but yeah, at, at any one time, there's always some part burning the midnight oil, worrying away about you know, either a current crisis or trying to stop the next one. And intellectually, uh, was it more demanding being in the city uh, or being here at the heart of government? Or does it require a different part of the mind? They're not as different as you might think. Um, I mean, certainly, having spent most of my career in the civil service, to go and try and become an investment banker required quite a lot of mental agility and some lots of new learning. Um, and there's some very, very clever people who work in banking, uh, investment banking, um, working on very complicated products, possibly too complicated, mm -hmm. um, and giving serious, high integrity advice to corporate leaders, mm -hmm. much the same way as we give a, yeah. you know, high integrity advice, I hope, to uh, political leaders. So this. And many of the same core skills are required. But fundamentally, banking is about making money for your clients and therefore for your bank and therefore for yourself. Uh, whereas, you know, money doesn't really feature in the, in the motivation of people working in Downing Street. Um, anyone working in Downing Street could triple, quadruple their money if they wanted to, but they're there because they want to serve the Prime Minister and the government of the day. In terms of the quality of the intellect, and also the, uh, the uh, volume of work, uh, w which is the more demanding? What, the volume of work or the quality? Uh, no, no, ah, sorry, the volume of work and, and, and the intellectual uh, depth of, of uh, the that's capacity that's required, banking as against running number 10. I think in quantity of work, uh, there's not much to choose between them. Mm. Um, 
actually, you know, people in banking work incredibly long hours. Um, I would say in terms of depth of intellect, mm. um, I, again, it's not as different as you might think. There are very, very clever, mm. intelligent, analytical people in, on both sides. Yeah. To me, uh, working on major public policy questions, the sort of big issues of the day, mm. is more demanding than, than just trying to sort out how to IPO a company or whether to take over a company. I think the breadth of discipline you need to be on top of, you know, somehow trading off social, economic, fiscal, environmental, social. There are so many different factors involved in good public policy making, so many different barriers to delivery that need to be considered. If you compare that with the task of advising corporates, I think it is a more complicated yeah. terrain. But that's not to say the people working in the city and the private sector more generally you know, aren't some very, very able people, because they certainly are. And the jobs of being principal private secretary to the PM and uh, latterly perm sec here in the building contrasted to being cabinet secretary. Mm. Which are they demanding in different ways? Can you describe the, the, the human qualities you need to carry out both those tasks? Yeah, I mean, they are slightly different, obviously. Um, as cabinet secretary, um, you have to give more advice, really, in your own right, because quite, quite a lot of if something goes wrong with a particular minister's conduct or um, if, if there's a, yeah, a letter from an MP uh, about some impropriety or allegation of impropriety, it's the cabinet secretary's view they want, not the civil services view. So you've got to put your own name to that. Mm. Um, and th th therefore, there's much more personal responsibility in that sense. Um, Whereas if you're the principal private secretary, you're there really to sort of make sure that the, that the trains run on time, if you like, that the papers are in the box. And of course, your views are sought, mm. but you know, you're one voice out of many, and it's more of a sort of challenge role rather than you know, the person who has to be publicly accountable for the advice. Who's, at the time, you know, I, quite often I'm in cabinet and the prime minister will say, well, I think we need a paper from the cabinet secretary on that. Or you know, I'll, I'll pipe up I'll half listening to prime minister's questions as the prime minister sort of says, like the cabinet secretary says X. Mm -hmm. You're just much more of a figure in your own right, and therefore you have to be that bit much more careful that the advice you're giving is fully rigorous, fair, and so on. So I think there's a bit more personal accountability as cabinet secretary. Um, isn't it the greatest fun in the world to be principal private secretary to the prime minister, seeing everything that the prime minister does and uh, what he's saying and who he's meeting, uh, but without quite that degree of personal responsibility? Isn't this the perfect job for anybody? Well, I'm quite lucky. Whichever job I'm doing at any point in time, I think is the perfect job. So I really enjoy being principal private secretary to the chancellor, mm. to the prime minister, but I, I love being cabinet secretary. And I, I wouldn't compare the two. I certainly wouldn't want to go back now yeah. to the rough and tumble of being principal private secretary. W would it be a necessary progression into cabinet secretary to have done that job for the prime minister or just a desirable progression? I don't think it's essential. Um, Gus didn't uh, play that role. Uh, but having some understanding of how number 10 works uh, is a real advantage, I think. So I wouldn't completely rule out future cabinet secretaries doing the job without having that experience. But I think if they didn't have either treasury or cabinet office experience, it would be really quite difficult. Gus, of course, had treasury experience and he had been chief press secretary from 1990 to 94. Yes. So had a parallel kind of experience. Yeah, so he'd, he'd got number 10 experience, he yeah. hadn't got PPS experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it certainly helps a lot, but I, I, I think it would be too extreme to say you couldn't do the job without that experience. The, 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 the pressure uh, on the Prime Minister in um, at the ER, ERM ejection compared to uh, the whole crisis in 2008, you were close to both those. Mm -hmm. um, can you compare them in any way? Was one more intense? No, they were both very, very intense. They were both, you know, all-nighters. Um, I think the ERM one, there was, you know, probably an extra ingredient of sort of, was the whole government falling apart? You know, was the whole government's economic strategy now in ruins? Whereas with the banking crisis, which is every bit as acute, it was much more a sense of, you know, uh, I think people were just sort of shocked. It had, been, it, it had crept, crept up on us more quickly in a way. I mean, the ERM crisis, you know, my recollection of 1992 was my entire summer holiday was spent sort of worrying about a Blackberry mm. as to what was happening to Sterling. And you know, it was a long, slow burn. It was obviously very, 
rapid when it happened. But uh, at the banking crisis too, there was a, there was a build-up. But I don't think there was quite the same sort of focus on is the UK going to do this, that, or the other. Sure. Uh, to that extent, we took people by surprise by sort of jumping ahead of expectations. Um, rather than just giving in to the inevitable. Um, so I think the government felt more in control at that point, and there was less, therefore less criticism of the government's sort of whole strategy falling apart. I think everyone was just caught up in the sort of enormity of the moment. Um, and we didn't have time really to think about that as we, we then spent the next few days and well, hours and days and weeks trying to persuade the rest of Europe to do something similar to what we were doing because it was all very well propping up our banks, but if everybody else's banks were going, that wouldn't help the permafrost in the financial system. So it's difficult to compare one crisis with another. You know, they're all equally difficult to manage. Uh, and along with 9-11, uh, were they the three biggest crises, or would you point to anything else? Um, I think those were th the three biggest ones I was involved in. Uh, obviously, I wasn't here for 7-7. I was taking my yes, spell in sure. banking. But I, I imagine that was a pretty, mm. pretty horrendous day in Downing Street. Uh, on the plus side, I think the sort of G20 summit and uh, the London summit um, in, in 2009, yeah. that was uh, an equally momentous day, I think, uh, but in a more positive direction. Can, uh, can you describe your particular memories of, of that event? Of the G20? 20, yeah, in London. Oh, my clearest memory of that was seeing the British Prime Minister uh, basically cajoling, I wouldn't use the bullying word, but he, he sort of pushed through a uh, incredibly ambitious uh, communique uh, when people, leaders were sort of straggling back from lunch and hadn't quite sort of sorted themselves out, uh, certainly didn't have their Sherpa advisors behind them. And Gordon just basically <laughs> sort of seized the moment um, before any of the officials were in the room really to sort of go through the communique line by line, get approval, and uh, it was a remarkable feat of um, diplomacy. Yeah. I'm not sure I would call it diplomacy, but it was very <laughs> successful. Uh, and we ended up with an extraordinary set of um, uh, decisions, mm. which I think even the leaders themselves were shocked they'd agreed, mm. uh, but the sort of momentum of the moment sort of carried, carried it. And I think that was a really important moment for the world economy, and it was, it was good to be part of it, actually. Uh, and was it... Uh uh, fortunate that, that there was a Prime Minister who was so economically literate at the time. How did he manage to, to bring that coup off, would you say? Well, he had, uh, had been a finance minister yeah. and had been very closely involved with the IMF, mm -hmm. so he knew the terrain pretty well. Yeah. Um, and that was definitely a huge advantage. He had a clear information advantage over everybody else in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also in the chair mm -hmm. and decided the, the work practice of you know when we were going to sort of sprint towards the conclusion as opposed to sticking to the agenda that had been previously agreed. So he had all the cards in his hand. Um, but I think, you know, I think the, the civil service played a really, really mm. important role preparing him um, and sort of doing a lot of the, the yeah. clearing away the negotiations. Um, so it was a very good team effort, Treasury Cabinet Office, uh, running up to that. And um, so it was, a, it was a good performance all around for the UK PLC, but more importantly, actually for the world economy, he got a shot of confidence at precisely the right moment. And uh, President Obama came over for that London G20 yes. that spring. Uh, was he one of the more remarkable men you've seen, or would you point us to anybody else? Uh, well, I'm not going to pick and choose amongst world leaders, but it's definitely <laughs> true at that, at that time. He, he was a you know, highly charismatic, yeah. um, his first trip. And we, you know, as we sometimes do, uh, lined up uh, downstairs and clapped him in. Mm. And he had that sort of star quality. But that whole, I mean, we had a wonderful dinner in that room over there uh, mm. for the G20. With just leaders. Uh, number 10 is beautiful in those sorts of evenings. It's uh, very intimate. Mm. You just sort of see the power in the room. Mm. Um, and you just know you're sort of involved around the edges, albeit, uh, of historic moments. Uh, it's great to be part of that. So that was in the state dining room. Can you tell a, a historic moment from a mundane moment? Yeah, you never quite know which moments are going to sort of last <laughs> in the memory, but there are some moments which clearly are. Yeah. I mean, it's not often we host a, a sort of gathering of world leaders on mm -hmm. the eve of a sort of massive international summit designed to save the world. Uh, that only happens once, once or twice a career, I suspect. But there are other sort of magical moments when we had 
you know, the Queen, for example, the Queen, we had the Queen's, some of the Queen's celebrations with her former Prime Ministers uh, at various Jubilees and various anniversaries. Those have been really lovely uh, afternoons or evenings as well. Um, seeing, the, seeing the Queen with all the Prime Ministers, who, you know, I haven't actually seen the, the play. Mm. I must go and see it, <laughs> uh, the audience. Um, but, uh, you know, they're obviously deeply respectful of the Queen mm. and s seeing all her sort of living Prime Ministers together as we did, I think it must have been, I can't remember when it was now, 2002 probably. Yes. Um, uh, that, that was a, a tremendous evening. It, it was the um, 50th anniversary. Yes. Uh, and um, so uh, the year before there'd been 9-11, mm. uh, is there anything that you feel you can say for this record about your recollections of that day here in this uh, building? Well, I think you've had it from, from others, from Richard Wilson in particular. Uh, I mean, it really was an extraordinary afternoon. Uh, I, I can't remember where I had been. I'd been, I think, probably at the ICA for lunch or something. And I came back to sort of see pictures on the you know, Sky News or whatever we had up in the private office of the first plane going in. And people were sort of quickly saying to me, you never guess what's happened. And at that point, no one quite knew whether this was just like a terrible accident. Mm -hmm. or, and then literally, as we were standing there, another one went in. And it was just quite extraordinary. Um, so the Prime Minister was actually not in the office. I think it was down in Brighton, wasn't he? Or yeah. a, a, a trade union. Yeah, absolutely. Trade union, uh, was precisely where he was. And you know, the foreign policy advisor wasn't there. So it was basically me and the duty clerk and a couple of other people sort of. <laughs> And I remember Tony Blair phoning up and saying, you know, you better just jump, double check this, there aren't any airplanes coming towards Downing Street. You know, the last thing had been on my mind, I was just like watching the TV, seeing what was going on. But then I went into a sort of rather fruitless round of phone calls trying to find somebody, mm. you know, who might know how to handle the situation. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we, it wasn't very satisfactory, frankly. We, we've certainly tightened up our procedures since then. Mm. Um, so some people were up in Easing World on a training course and other people were out for lunch and we didn't have their mobile phones and you know it was just you know not great um, and then the Prime Minister came back obviously and I think it was that afternoon he sort of assembled all Britain's leading experts on the you know the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and you know we sat down and spent the next two or three days trying to work out what on earth Mm. This was all about, and you know, a massive sort of attempt to understand the nature of this phenomenon mm. that we hadn't really focused on. Um, and that was, again, the system at its very best. Everybody from MI6 and the Foreign Office and MOD and obviously the Cabinet Office rallying around um, and being supportive to the Americans and, you know, obviously looking immediately at our procedures. Um, it was a very, very, you know, tough period. So amongst other memorable moments, uh, there is the, which you referred to, was the uh, ending of the premiership and, and the clapping out. Can you uh, describe any particular clapping out and then the arrival of the, the, the incomer, perhaps mm. in 2010? Yeah, those are very, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're amazing mm. uh, occasions, those, because clearly we'd had... Uh, the, the long drawn out departure of Gordon Brown. Um, I mean, he became aware, obviously, fairly early on, he wasn't going to stay on as Prime Minister, mm. but he was feverishly trying to find a way of keeping Labour in the game. Mm. Um, and that, when it became clear that wasn't going to happen, he quick, he sort of composed himself and sort of decided, you know, when he was going to leave and so on. Um, and unusually for that sort of situation because it was it had been a long drawn out period uh, as opposed to sort of just losing the election overnight as it were a lot of his special advisors and political team were, were still there and of course we've been working with these people for three years mm. so you know they've become close colleagues i mean they're political we're civil servants but nevertheless you work closely together for a period so th there was a scene of great sort of emotion mm. as Gordon Brown and Sarah and the kids sort of left and Gordon made a very beautiful speech to the staff. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, seeing some friends leave, uh, that was, that was, it was a tough time. But obviously all the civil servants in the room knew that within sort of 45 minutes we were going to get the, the incoming government through the door. Um, so we had to clean up the place and sort of get rid of all the new Labour memorabilia uh, and just make sure we were ready to go with a new regime because that's what the people of Britain had decided. So 
it was quite tough to, just on a human level, to sort of shift from sort of the emotion of the brand departure and all the special advisors, but yet being sort of completely up for the new regime coming in. And I can't quite remember what the time frame was, but it didn't, it felt like, like, like five minutes, really. Um, I think it was more like half an hour. Um, but I think we carried it off really well. I mean, I, you know, the great virtue of the civil service is that you know, it, it is very professional when it comes to maintaining that impartiality and that continuity. Mm. And, you know, it was much remarked upon at the time. Of course, we, we had a coalition to deal with as well, so that brought an extra piece of sort of uncertainty. But just shifting very quickly from one regime which we'd all serve very loyally mm. to another regime that we were very eager to serve loyally, mm. that is just almost like the hardest, but in some ways the most exhilarating moment you ever get as a civil... I mean, it, just in that moment it sort of sums up the duty of the civil servant to you know, be completely impartial and to work with whoever is elected. Um, and you know, there's nothing that brings it home to you more than having to you know, turn around on a sixpence in the space of an hour. And the staff then line up for the incoming of the new prime minister just these minutes later and clap the new Prime Minister. Well, I'm just trying to remember now. I mean, it, was quite, it felt quite late in the day by that point, so I can't remember whether we had a rather bedraggled crowd or not, but yeah. uh, certainly uh, Gus and I were there at the mm. front door. And, um, uh, you know, and then we had another sort of moment the next day when Nick Clegg came as well. Mm. Um, so it was quite, I mean, I'm trying to remember now, it was about 8.30 or 9 o'clock yeah. in the evening, I think, by the time it sort of happened. But yes, I'm sure there's, there's some staff are outside and I'm sure some staff are inside. It certainly felt like a very momentous moment. And that's a very special moment between the incoming Prime Minister and his most senior advisers who are going to be working with him. Yes, well, actually, Ed, that's historic, Ed Llewellyn, it? Steve Hilton, Andy Coulson, the team came in before David and Samantha yeah. Cameron came in, because I think the prime, obviously David and Samantha went to the palace, um, whereas the advisors came through yeah. 70. So we'd already shown them around Downing Street and, mm. and started to sort of get to know each other, as it were. Mm. And then for them, of course, they went out into the street to wave their, their boss in. That, that must have been a fantastic moment for them because they'd been working for that election victory. And um, you know, if you're working that hard, it's great to see it sort of in action. Yes. Uh, and we, worked, we worked quite late that night, my, my recollection. Uh, that's by the recollection was misleading me. And a uh, very quick question there on the uh, wife who you mentioned. D does the wife of the Prime Minister play an important part in, in this building? Has it changed? Um, I think it probably varies from, from wife, spouse yeah. to, to, yeah. to, you know. Um, but obviously the, the wife of the Prime Minister or the husband of the Prime Minister uh, is a fundamental, plays a fundamental role in supporting the Prime Minister, keeping them sort of earthed, um, and actually quite often get involved in hosting charity receptions and sort of being with the Prime Minister for, you know, big events here. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a big time commitment as well. And, and you, Sir Jeremy, you have, uh, it, it's been now 20 years since you first started uh, working intensively with people in this building, even if as Principal Private Secretary to the Chancellor you were not coming in much personally. Um, you are going to be around for uh, a good number of years. That, that's a very long 25-year period, it might be, of um, uh, exposure to, to this building at the heart of British government. It's akin to the kind of length of service of an Edward Bridges or a Norman Brook. Uh, two quick final questions. Do you ever have moments where you slightly wished you were on the other side and were a politician yourself? Never. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. You, you, you chose the right. right. I, I, you I chose, chose the right course. You I'm, chose the right I'm, course. I'm you certainly wouldn't have had 25 years if you'd chosen the other uh, route. Yeah. And. Uh, the principal changes, apart from the much-loved BlackBerry, which I think deserves an airing there on the camera, uh, apart from the, 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 the digital technology mm -hmm. uh, over that period, what else would you point uh, students uh, and lovers uh, of this building and its history to? I think we said it already. I mean, it's the pace yeah. of... Uh, the media, the pace of government, the degree of sort of uh, impatience on, on the part of the public for 
speed of response. Yeah. Um, it just feels much tougher. Uh, I, I think the civil service has become much more open as well. Yeah. Um, I think the civil service has become much less hierarchical. Um, it's a younger organisation in feel. Um, so much has changed, most of it for the better, actually. That was uh, so stimulating, interesting listening to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sir Jeremy. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.